Mm. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, hopefully you're here for our co-op live. Um, I can see just a few people joining in, so I'll give them a minute. There we go. So um, thank you very much for joining our co-op live um, tonight on retail crime. Um, my name is Emma Hodinot. I'm one of the Assistant General Secretaries here at the co-op party. And we've um, got a really great lineup of speakers um, here tonight to talk about this issue, um, something that's really important to us as a movement. And um, before I move on to that, though, we have a little bit of uh, housekeeping um, just to let you uh, know about. So this um, Zoom is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear on Zoom, turn your camera off. Um, we do make them available to members afterwards to view on our YouTube channel. So um, turn your camera off if you don't want to appear. In terms of uh, closed captioning, um, then that is available um, through Zoom. And there is a button down at the bottom in the tools. And you can activate that if you need that going forward. So as I said, um, Oh, we're going to hear from some great speakers and there's also the opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, there is a chat function, so you can post your comments, questions in there as we go along as well. And we'll hopefully pick up some of those um, before the hour is done. But as I said, we've got a really great panel um, to talk about um, the issues tonight. We know retail crime is a huge issue on our high streets and it has an impact on the retailers, shop workers and communities um, that we're all part of. And we're going to hear from um, people who reflect the, those different parts. So we've got Paul Gerald, who's the Campaigns Public Affairs and Board Secretariat and Director of the Co-op. And we've got Paddy Lillis, who is General Secretary of Usdor. And we've got Emily Spurrell, who is the Police and Crime Commissioner for Merseyside. And I should say a Labour and Co-op Crime Commissioner uh, for Merseyside and standing again for us. <coughs> Um, in May. And actually, I can see from some of our participants as well, we've got some of our Labour and Co-op candidates for Police and Crime Commissioner elections as well. So thank you very much um, for joining us. So it is a real issue. And actually, throughout the last year, as a movement and with our partners, with the trade unions, with the, the group and the societies, we've been campaigning on this issue because it is escalating. We know that violence, threats and abuse um, towards retail staff is increasing. And what we're seeing is that there, there isn't enough being done about it. And often it's organized crime gangs are stealing to order and persistently repeating these offenses in the same shops as well. So we've been working with uh, the trade unions and the societies, and we were really pleased last year to get a vital policy commitment from the Labour Party um, to address this crisis and protect shop workers going forward. But we haven't got a Labour government yet, and actually we need action now from the co current government as well. So we're here tonight to discuss um, the next steps, what we can do about this issue and what more we can um, campaign on as well, particularly as we've got those important police and crime commissioner elections in May as well, um, and lots of local government uh, um, elections as well ahead of a general election. So what more can we do to campaign on this issue um, talk about this issue and really make sure that we as a movement are responding to the concerns of those people in our communities. So without further ado, I will um, hand over to Paddy Lillis, who is the General Secretary of Usdor, one of our affiliated um, unions to the co-op party. And it's been great to work with you over the past year, and in particular, a really successful Respect for Shop Workers Week as well um, that we had at the end of last year. So, but I will hand over to you, Paddy, for, to give your perspective on this really important issue. No, thanks very much, Emma. A big thank you as well to the co-op party. I mean, it's really important that we keep this issue right front and centre. Uh, we have been, as a, a union, been campaigning now for 20 years um, on this issue of uh, abuse, threats and violence towards retail staff. And working closely with the co-op group, uh, the British Retail Consortium, 
the, the association of convenience stores, um, uh, and and even the independent independent retailers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the the incidence of uh, abuse that's in balance towards retail staff has uh, massively increased. It was bad during the pandemic, uh, surprisingly, when we had retail workers out working in their communities, serving the communities, ensuring the communities are fed and still were abused at alarmingly high rates. And it continues. There's a number, there's probably a number of issues uh, that you have. You have for many years, I would call uh, the, the issues around uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, uh, sort of abuse and addiction, uh, where people's get in and stealing uh, to support their habits. You then have a cost of living crisis now where you have uh, sadly, uh, mums and dads going in and stealing issues to try to feed their families and not condoning that, but understand that. But more importantly, we've seen over the last number uh, of years, uh, criminal gangs now targeting retail um, as an easy touch. They can move around, they can look for the easy, the easy uh, touches um, and they can uh, make uh, big, big profits by selling to people who are, are struggling at the minute with this cost of living crisis. And the, the issue overall is, you know, a thousand incidents a day that we have, we have been able to uh, ascertain. A thousand retail workers been abused, threatened or assaulted every day just for going to work. Uh, it, you know, it, it's appalling and it has to stop. And I'm pleased to be working with all the organisations, uh, but we do need action from government. We need action from government to make it a specific standalone offence. Um, at the moment, we have it on the basis of it will be considered an aggravated, uh, 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 an aggravated uh, position uh, by the magistrate, but only consider it doesn't mean to say it will be dealt with. We need it to, be, make it to mean business, to say to the criminal fraternity, if you abuse, threaten or assault a shop worker, then you have a real danger you're going to go to prison for it. And at this moment in time, there's no danger. Of course, uh, very, very few people are caught because it's still not seen as a problem. It's seen as a very, very low down the police priorities. And we need to get that back up. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, a £200 limit where it can go to Magistrates Court, but in reality, it's a fixed penalty ticket. Of course, that gives a green light to these uh, perpetual criminals who think it's OK. Um, and we need to see more uh, a more serious approach to it from the judiciary, uh, from the police. And uh, you know we're working with retailers. I mean, last year, sorry, the year before, a billion pound was spent uh, on security measures to try to protect stock and protect staff. And of course, in that same year, a billion pound of shoplifting took place. Uh, easy target, and given there's a very little in terms of police response, so the criminal fraternity know if they get caught. They'll get a smack in the wrist. Uh, the likelihood is they're not going to get caught, and we need to see uh, a, a better police response to this. And of course, we understand, uh, you know, with all the cutbacks uh, in, in the public sector and the police in particular, they've got to prioritise what they're doing. Um, and that takes money and takes resources and takes a willingness from government to make it happen. And, and, and we have spent, I mean, myself and Paul, uh, who will be speaking next. Uh, give evidence to a select committee just before Christmas. We've continued to meet with the Home Office and different politicians and different parties to try to get this through. And we have a criminal justice bill going through Parliament at the minute, and we are saying this is your big opportunity to demonstrate for once and for all you're on the side of retail workers and, it, and put in a, uh, an aggravated uh, uh, position into the legislation, exactly the same as Scotland's done with the Daniel Johnson bill, where from it was introduced in February 2021, uh, we have seen an additional 6,000 cases investigated by the police. So when you have legislation, you have the police prioritising, things can get done. Of course, will it stop violence? All the, of course it will not. But it will go some way to reassure those workers, those retail workers, that the, par the parliamentarians are on their side, the retailers are on their side, and the representatives of the workers are on their side. We stand together as one on that. So that's a quick overview of where we are. It is an appalling position, and we need to do everything we can. Just finish this note. Stats come out yesterday, and this is quite frightening. They only come out yesterday. These are from the Home Office. 500 cases a day were closed last year in England and Wales, were closed by the police because no suspect could be identified. And over 200,000 cases dropped last year altogether by the police. 
and there's been in from 2019 843,000 shopliftings investigations closed without a suspect being investigated. Now that tells me everything I need to know. It's not a priority for the authorities, and it really needs to. It needs to be a priority. It's not a victimless crime. In terms of the stock that's been lost, we all pay for it. But more importantly, from my position, the human side of it, every single retail worker who's abused, threatened, or, or, or assaulted uh, has an impact on them, has an impact on their families, has an impact on the National Health Service in terms of mental health issues and everything else. So it really needs to be drawn to attention very, very clearly and action taken by government on this. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much, um, Paddy, and thank you for outlining the issues um, so well and, and some of those opportunities coming forward. But just to reflect on your, your last point, um, we, we talk about retail crime and people think it's a, a crime uh, against business, but it is against shop workers and that, that human impact um, really is quite um, stark. I managed to meet, uh, meet the staff in my local co-op store before Christmas as part of um, Respect for Shop Workers Week. And they were telling me that, you know, most of them had unfortunately ex had a bad experience with shoplifting or being assaulted. Um, and they were reminding me that every day they have to go back to the scene of the crime. Every time they go back to work, they have to go back to where they've been assaulted. And we wouldn't expect that of anybody else, but that's what they face day in, day out. Um, in terms of that. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to Paul, um, who is going to give that perspective from the, the CART group. And I know from the, the staff that I talked to that you're investing an awful lot as a, as a store. They showed me all the security measures and the cameras and everything that you're doing to protect staff, but also shared some of those frustrations as well that we heard from Paddy about the, the lack of action. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Paul. Thank you, Emma, and thank you to the CART party for posting this. Um, and before I start, I just want to um, just remind everyone, just something Paddy said right at the beginning there, that us Dora have been campaigning on this for the thick end of 20 years. Uh, Corp Co Group has been uh, um, probably its staunchest supporter over the last five or six years. But I think whatever progress we've made over the last recent years has been absolutely built on what Paddy and colleagues have done at us Dora to keep this issue very much alive. Uh, so real huge huge um, um, dose of gratitude that my 50,000 colleagues in stores owe to Paddy and his colleagues at Usdor. Um, I'll try I'll try not to repeat what Paddy said, partly because I'd bore you, and so, secondly, Paddy said it be said it better than me, so I won't I won't repeat. Um, just a few things though, just to put some numbers on this. Um, in our two and a half thousand court group stores across the UK. Uh, we have seen in the first 10 months of 2023 a 44% increase in incidents. What does that look like? That looks like a 1,000 significant incidents every single day across that store. We've also seen a 38% increase in abuse. That's 100 of my colleagues will be seriously abused today, tomorrow, <laughs> yesterday, and every other day. And there's been a 36% increase in levels of violence which means that last year, every single day, five of my colleagues will have been attacked, physically attacked. A number of those attacks each day will be with a weapon. It could be a, a bottle, it could be a knife, it could be a syringe, it, it could be a baseball bat. That rise in crime, and that's, I think, the thing that is most concerning people who've worked in retail for many years. That rise in crime of 44% isn't unique to the co-op. Speak to Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, all of them. They're all seeing the same thing. But what's driving that? We need to be really clear about that. What is driving What is driving the individuals that are behind that in stores are not individuals who are stealing a ham sandwich and a can of Coke. It's not people in the main who are stealing to feed themselves. It is being driven, as Paddy said, by criminal organisations who are stealing huge volumes of product en masse in order to resell. Now, clearly, if you've in a cost of living crisis within double digit inflation, you've got probably a, a bigger market for people desperate to buy cheap food. But we need to be clear that what's driving the kind of crime we are seeing in our stores is a level of organisation that we've not seen before. And again, just to give you an example of that, speaking to a college before Christmas, 
um, who looks after a number of stores in Greater Manchester, two individuals are visiting those stores every day and rinsing us for about £500 a time across those stores every day. That's £3,500 a week. It's £182,000 a year. And if they get a third of the value of the product when they fence it, that means that individually, each of them has got about a £30,000 a year after tax income. And I'm guaranteed as a former HMRC, paying tax. they've got an income of £30,000 a year from just from attacking co-op stores. Those individuals are abusive. They are threatening. They have been arrested only once. Okay. But what was interesting is that even though they have attacked my co co colleagues, abused my colleagues, stolen hundreds of thousands of pounds of the product, the only time the police took an investigation forward was when a police officer was assaulted. Now, my colleagues are absolutely clear that if a police officer is assaulted, that individual should get arrested and charged. Equally, if that individual has, has attacked and abused my colleagues, that, that, that should also be investigated, and it hasn't been. That's common every day, right across the corp, right across retail. Um, em, em, Emma mentioned uh, the investment the corp group has made. I, I'm not unique in saying this, and Paddy will have heard this from lots of retailers. The first responsibility to keep colleagues safe, keep shops safe, is for the business. It's not for the police. The shop has, the, the business has to take, take, take care of people. The, at the corp group, we spend four times the national sector average per store on keeping colleagues safe, keeping stores safe. So if you, as Emma said, you know, you can go into many of our stores, you'll see colleagues with body-worn cameras. You'll see every single colleague with, with a headset. You'll see state-of-the-art CCTV. You'll see covert guarding on doors. You may see undercover guarding where they arrest someone in store. You, you will see product protection on steak and chicken and wine and bleach and um, baby milk. You'll see stores designed so that very high value products are at the back of stores. You're trying to sell products. You put them where people can see them. We're having to put product at the back of stores to try to deter people. But there comes a point, even as the co-op does, where we're spending four times a sector average, that actually you need some support. And, and Paddy mentioned the financial cost of this as well, as well as the cost to our colleagues. We estimate last year it will cost us £75 million in lost product alone. Over and above the £40 million to spend, we spend every single day, sorry, every single year to keep colleagues safe. All that is members' money. All that is money and value for our members because we're a member-owned co -co 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 cooperative. And I think, but there comes a point, no matter what we do, and as Paddy said, the retail sector spends a billion pounds a year, that you need the police support. Now, I'm not here to slag off the, slag off the police. Absolutely not. I'm a former law enforcement officer. I spent a decade in law enforcement in customs and excise. My brother's a former police sergeant. And, I, as, and as Paddy just said, I absolutely agree. The police are under huge stretch. But we just need to be clear that what has happened in effect over the last few years is that retail crime has been decriminalised. That's what has happened. And it's been decriminalised because the police are so stretched, this is not a priority. It is simple as that. It's not a priority. We did a free of information request early this year, and it said that in 70% of occasions where my colleagues have asked for assistance at a co-op group store, and they only ask for assistance in serious cases, not when someone's nicked a ham sandwich, 70% of times the police have not attended. Seven times out of ten. Even when our undercover teams have detained offenders in store, we have them under our control. We've made a citizen's arrest as the policing ministry is keen for us to do. In 80% of occasions, the police don't turn up, which means we have to let them go. So the so a big factor in that growth is absolutely the decriminalisation because of lack of police attendance. Now, we raised these concerns, as Paddy has done for, for two decades or more, but we really went for this early in the year. And the police responded. To be fair, the, the police on the 23rd of October published the National Retail Crime Action Plan that says that they will, wherever possible, uh, guarantee to attend where there's violence, where there's abuse, where someone's been detained, or where they need to collect evidence. And we welcome that hugely. It's a massive step forward. But at the minute, it's only words. We need the police to actually begin to do that. Because at the minute, today, there'll be a thousand incidents in court stores. Five colleagues will be, will be attacked. A hundred will be seriously abused. So the police have made a commitment and now we need to see them follow that through. 
And there are signs from some forces that they're doing so and they are stepping up and that's good. We, we need to see it right, right across the piece. The last thing I would say is about the standalone defence. And I gave evidence in Scotland when Daniel Johnson was taking his bill through. And um, we've campaigned in the court group for a number of years about the need for a standalone offence. Um, and just some thoughts on why we need one. Um, we, as I said before, we, we are a member of our cooperative. We we took a, we, we did some work with our members and a representative sample of our 5 million members, 85% of court group members support the idea of a standalone offence. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, if Parliament were to make it as an offence, a standalone offence to abuse or attack a shop worker, it will send a phenomenally powerful signal to three groups. Number one, to the individual gang, individuals and gangs, that they would face a particular sanction for retail crime, which escalates to violence. Secondly, it would make a very a strong message to the police that Parliament, as the legislators, legislators of this country, feel it is important that there should be a standalone offence, and therefore an attack on a shop worker, it should be taken seriously, like attacking an emergency worker, police, or indeed when, when I was a customs and excise officer, customs and excise officer. So it's a message to the police. But finally, and for me most importantly, it would send a colleague, it would send a message to my 50,000 colleagues in the co-op group and the 3 million colleagues, 3 million shop workers in the country, that actually the legislature and the criminal justice system gives a monkeys about what happens to shop, shop, shop workers. Because at the minute... I assure you now, many of my colleagues think the police don't care and the courts don't, don't, don't care. A standalone offence would be easier to investigate and convict. And it would also give additional impetus for the police to take seriously the commitments they made in the action plan. And just to be clear, you know, why do I say that? If you look at Scotland and we looked at the Freedom of Information request, Police Scotland were in the top five forces for attendance and charging. They didn't used to be, but they are now. Moreover, and as, per, as, pa, as Paddy just said, at the minute, in England and Wales, less than 10% of incidents result in a charge. In Scotland, it's 60%. 60% of incidents that are reported through the standalone offence are resulting in an arrest. In England and Wales, it is less than 10%. And I think the reason for that is that it has really helped sh focus the minds of the police in Scotland to take this seriously, and that's what we need. So when we eventually, hopefully, have the amendment that will come forward on the Criminal Justice Bill, I hope all of you will help. All of you will write to your MP and try and get your MP to support it, and certainly within co-op group, we will ask not just our colleagues, but our members to do, to do the same as well. We have a moment, I think, now that means we can really press home the kind of work that Paddy and team have done for 20 years, so that we can get shop workers the respect and protection that they deserve. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much, um, Paul. And, and a really important point about the way forward. And I think I'll, I'll touch on that after we hear from Emily as well. But there's a real opportunity for us to, to um, move forward on this issue. And I think that opportunity to make it a standalone offence. And, and just to kind of recap, a few years ago, we got it... Um, as an aggravated you know, through a lot of campaigning um we got um sort of the um violence against retail workers as an aggravated um offense what we do know is that is not well it's not even being tracked we don't even know if it's being used and actually the evidence from scotland is if it was a standalone offense you are able to track it and it sends a really strong um message and it seems from you know as you say paul it's a complete no-brainer and there's a huge opportunity to to make this happen through the forthcoming bill as well so um, I'm going to bring in Emily um, next. Emily is kindly um, joining us, um, if I put it politely, from the middle of nowhere. So her camera <laughs> will be off to make sure that we can hear her properly. Um, but Emily is the Labour and Co-op um, Police Co and Crime Commissioner um, for Merseyside. And is she there? I can't actually see her. She may yes. have lost. Yeah. Oh, yes, you're there. There you go. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So I will hand over to you, Emily. And obviously, as a police and crime commissioner, you're very much on the ground and, and dealing um, with these issues with your local police force. So we'd really welcome your perspective on this. 
Yes, uh, thank you. And, and as Emma says, apologies, I am struggling with my connection at the minute. So hopefully you can hear me and, and I'll get through um, my thoughts on what we've, what we've um, heard so far. Um, I think I would echo as well what Paul said in terms of, uh, you know, credit to Co-op and Osdor. This is something that I've kind of been kind of involved on the fringes of for a long time, but I think it is a hugely important issue. Um, I was elected three years ago and it was a priority within my police and crime plan then, recognising the huge value that, um, that we get from our retail work workers and how important the staff are in terms of not just you know providing a service to the community but in terms of that front line of protecting communities they are the people who will um you know restrict sales of things like knives fireworks you know alcohol so actually they're a big part of our approach to tackling community safety so i think it's right that actually if they're doing that and they're part of this work that we're doing to keep communities safe that they should have that protection support from the police as well when they need it um, so, um, so yeah, so absolutely welcome um, all the work that's been done. Um, it is great as well. So we've got lots of new Labour and Co-op candidates as well, standing in May, as Emma said, and lots of them are putting retail um, crime as a priority in their manifestos as well, which is really welcome. Um, and also the support we've got from Alex Norris as our shadow uh, policing minister as well is really great. And he's really pushing this forward. Um, so I think there's a real kind of sway from the kind of, sort of the political side of things, um, which is really welcome. So I suppose in terms of the police response, you know, both Paddy and Paul have alluded to the fact that the police response has not been good enough um, and certainly still has a, a long way to go. Uh, you know, it is important that I think we've had that commitment now from the National Police Chiefs Council. They've got a retail plan. They've acknowledged there is more they need to do. And as Paul says, it's now about how we see that put into practice. And I think this is where the role of PCCs is really important because a huge part of what we do is, you know, after setting those priorities is, is scrutinising chief constables, making sure that actually police forces are responding appropriately they scrutinize that performance you know they challenge they will find out why they're not doing well when they should be doing um and i think that's something that uh, pcs you know up in the country are indeed are doing and hopefully more will, will do after the election as well um, I think as well, and again, it's been highlighted uh, already in terms of the impact of austerity. And I think we can't get away from that. You know, when I reflect on the challenges that Merseyside in particular has had in the last few years, you know, they've seen some hugely challenging incidents of organised crime. And, you know, naturally that does then take the focus away from other areas. But I think we have to recognise that that doesn't mean that the crime against retail uh, workers or retail businesses is any less important and should be tackled in the same way. And actually what we know is that quite a lot of the time the individuals who are um, committing this retail crime and shoplifting and this theft they are very likely involved in other crimes as well um, you know, and as, as again has been alluded to, um, those links to organised crime in particular. So actually, you know, there's no good putting it in a box and saying actually that's a different crime and it's low level and we're not going to take it seriously because these things are absolutely linked together. Um, and so actually, if we tackle retail crime, chances are we're going to be tackling many more other issues as well that our communities will be experiencing. And I think, you know, one of the things that I know that as a Labour Party we're really pushing is around that neighbourhood policing approach. Um, and again, it's something that as PCCs we're really pushing our chiefs to invest in because having those local officers who are on the ground, having those, you know, people who know the local stores, know the local security guards, you know, but also then know the local people. They'll recognise the faces of the repeat offenders because so many of this has been done by repeat offenders. And actually, you know, we, we know who they are. Neighbourhood policing should know who they are. And it's just about working with the businesses to actually then get them and get the evidence to get the prosecution. So I think that investment in neighbourhood policing as well, and hopefully we'll see a lot more of it when we um, touch wood, get a Labour government, that I think will make a big difference as well in terms of what PCCs can do um, on the ground. Um, and then I suppose the only other thing as well to talk about is just what... Um, what else practically as PCCs we're trying to do, as well as that challenge to chiefs and holding police forces to account. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken with our local stores as well and, and had conversations with them. Um, we signed up to the Stop Shop Theft um, uh, pledge um, and I've met with our, our police force lead for retail crime, who is really trying to push this forward, which I really welcome. And there's some kind of, um, you know, changes that were already happening within Merseyside. So things like um, improving the reporting process, because that is something that a lot of stores were saying, it's just too complicated. You have to go through the website and it's, you know, it's taking too long. So actually, even when they haven't got an offender, but they just need somebody to know something's happened, it's just taking too long for them to do it. So they're working now with the stores to do a kind of a QR code and a, a much quicker process to gather that intelligence and that information, which means the local policing can respond much better knowing where the hotspot areas are and where things are happening. 
Um, and then I've also agreed, and again, other areas will have done this as well, other PCCs, um, to use money, um, what we call POCA, which is proceeds of crime, where we take money away from um, criminals and we reinvest into the community. And some of that money I'm using to invest into stores um, to help them in terms of tagging offenders um, through the kind of select DNA work um, and also um, improving in things like CCTV and, and trying to connect things up so we can get a better picture of who those um, problem people people are and trying to get much more sophisticated identifying them and then taking action more quickly as well so using some of those funds to help our stores actually invest in some of that technology that will help us to get hands on it as well so I think, you know, I, I would echo everything that, that Paddy and Paul has said. This is a huge important issue. I think PCCs have got a really um, important role to play in that. And I think lots of us are already starting to do that um, and keep up that pressure. But I think it's something that absolutely needs to keep on focus and certainly will be a priority, I think, within the upcoming elections when we get there. Thanks, Emma. Thank you very much, um, Emily, and thank you for sharing your perspective. And I think um, you're, you're right in keeping that sort of uh, that scrutiny on uh, police forces. I, we know from some of the, the data that the, the performance between police forces varies enormously. So there can be, even without those legislative changes and resources, there is a lot that can be done to, to change the current situation. And I think you talked about putting pressure on, uh, you putting on pressures uh, onto the, um, the chief constable. Um, we also have a guide for councillors as well about how they can help with that, particularly through your police and crime panels locally and it might be something that you want to take um, forward as well. And so we've got a little bit of time um, left um, for questions and, and questions to our panellists as well, because we have a whole wealth of experience um, and knowledge there as, as well. Um, and I'm going to bring in um, Paul Richards because he's, um, he's, he's sent through a really good question, actually, um, and I'd be really keen for you to, to ask that. And it's worth introducing Paul, who is our Labour and Cop candidate in Sussex as well for Police and Crime Commissioner. Hello, thanks, Emma. Um, that was a brilliant set of talks, and so thanks for everyone. Uh, like most of you, I sort of did the visit um, to a co-op store during Respect Worker, uh, Shop Workers Week, and it's unbelievable eye-opener. I mean, it really is. You can read it on a policy document, but to go into a store and hear the experience from those workers is absolutely transformational, actually, and it really opened my eyes. And while I was in there, um, you know, one of the persistent offenders actually wandered into the shop to try and steal stuff. And I saw an incident sort of playing out in front of my eyes. But what, what the, my question is this, that um, it seems obvious that there is organised crime behind it. But it's also obvious to me that they're using people with addictions um, who are fairly desperate and lawless to actually do perform the crimes, uh, as we say, to order. Um, but they're using people who are... Um, addicted to drugs and, and drink, not to feed themselves, but to get money to feed their addiction. So I just wondered whether there was a, a sort of a joined up approach beyond criminal justice and into public health, where we can try and get some sort of holistic approach to this and use addiction services um, and sort of trying to, you know, cut the um, that link between the gangs and the addicts so that they don't have the people to wander into the shops in the first place. Thoughts, please. Well, I go first if that's okay. Uh, you, Paul, you're right in that in terms of or organised crime will exploit uh, the more vulnerable to do the the sort of the dirty work, the leg work, um, and and at the heart of it, I mean, it's as much as dealing with the crime factor, dealing with the shoplifting and, and the violence and abuse. I think society, i.e., through government, through local authorities, through the health service, needs to look at some of the underlying addiction problems. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and uh, Dara said, and we're not going to get that under this government. Uh, there's a, a sort of a, a total lack of a joined up approach in terms of looking at society in general, you know, addiction uh, and how that leads on to crime, which un in inadvertently leads to our members being abused, threatened and assaulted in the workplace. It also means we have uh, high levels of shoplifting which we all pay for, all of society pays for at the end of the day. So unless we have a serious joined up approach, as you've just identified, and we've raised this, we've raised this with the Home Office, we've raised it with the Police and Crime Commissioners as and when, when we've got it. Uh, and that's that's takes, that takes a, a, a big piece of work. Uh, but when you think there's 3 million retail workers in this country, 
there's retailers in every high street, in every town centre, and, and, and every country village. Uh, they need to be protected as well. So I think uh, an incoming Labour government, we're already working with them, uh, talking through the issues and concerns. We need better resources. We need a more linked up approach between government, local authorities, and the communities in general. Um, but you're right, it's not just one, one, one thing is not going to fix this, but there needs a willingness from the top to make it happen. And at the minute, I don't believe that's there. Um, and if I can bring in Paul, because I know there's been some sort of one off initiatives, hasn't there, in terms of this and Central Co op uh, have got um, some initiatives around tackling this specific issue as well. But I'll hand over to you, Paul. Thank you. Um... You're absolutely right. So both Central and also Court Group have been funders of a thing called Offender to Rehab, um, <clears throat> which is a scheme running uh, the West Midlands by a guy called PC Stuart Toogood, um, which is his actual name, which is a fine name for a police officer to uh, have. Uh, yeah. Stuart, does some, Stuart does some amazing work. Um, a couple of years ago, we had one of his service users come to speak to our National Members Council. Now, if, if, if I can, Emma, it's worth just telling this very brief story because it speaks to Paul's point, which is that um, this lady had been addicted to a variety of drugs from the age of 15. Uh, she'd been in and out of prison for 20 years. Um, and what happened is that she went in, she she fed her addiction through theft. And we worked out that she'd probably stolen about 1.8 million um, wow. amount of product over that 20 year life. And she never got help. She just got sent, sent inside didn't get clean, came out, continued to do, to do it. She eventually got convicted because she was a prolific offender. And she got she got funding because of what Central Corp had done and we'd done. She got funding to um, do a, a course, a, re, a rehab course. And she did it. And she's never offended since. Not only she never offended since, she's now a mentor and a coach for people with substance abuse issues. So there's wow. someone who, if that intervention had been made years before, could have had a chance for a very different life. Now she has, a, she's an amazing woman that is really powerful, compelling speaker. But I guess it speaks to Paddy's point and the point you're making, Paul. Can you intervene? So I think there's something in there. I think the other thing is, this is why the standalone offence is so important. The standalone offence means that you and police attendance at incidents and the standalone offence gives you a point of intervention. Now, it may be that for some individuals, that point of intervention results in a custodial sentence. And I make no apologies for saying people who are <laughs> my and all that actually might, might well need to go to prison. But there will be lots of individuals there who actually need a different kind of intervention, perhaps not even a court intervention. It could be a restorative justice intervention. It could be a it could be a caution linked with other measures. There's a range of things you can do. And there's got to be a range of things, not just lock them up because that isn't going to work so i think if you get the police to attend and on attendance they can intervene either to take it through to prosecution in the courts or some non-court disposal then you can get you can get somewhere but you're absolutely right paul unless we start to tackle not you know i spent 10 years tackling organized crime on cigarettes alcohol and oils there's no point in just thinking you can you know attack the head man and, and you'll get them God, someone will take the place. You've got to do it all the way through. You've got to go, yes, for the kingpins, but yeah. you've got to begin to stop those who do the running. And that's about giving them different options. And at the minute, if you know the chances of getting a rehab order in this country are pretty slim. Pretty slim. Lost Emma. You're on mute, Emma. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I, I was just seeing if there was anything that Emily wanted to to add into that, and there was me thinking it was Emily's connection. Um, yes, I will say my connection is definitely suffering, so I may drop off again. Um, I think just to add in terms of uh, the, uh, what they've said in terms of those interventions, again, it is something that I think PCs are really focused on, um, and I think you know we all have things like com combating drugs. Yeah, and I'm talking again. Yep, we've lost her. 
I, I will move swiftly on. So um, we've got a, a really good question, actually, from Margaret um, Pinder. If I can bring in Margaret for you to, to ask your question, which I think is um, a good challenge as well, actually, uh, about the, the campaign. So over to you, Margaret. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. I'm finding this very interesting. Uh, I'm based in Beverly and Holderness. That's my constituency. So obviously in the Holderness bit, I think retail cram is a particularly problem in rural areas because of the difficulty of response. Now, my background is actually in law. I mean, not criminal law. So I'm quite interested in the legislative side of it. And the standalone offence, I think, is interesting. But I'm just wondering whether it's a way of getting more traction. And also, I think it's also worth considering looking at legislation which made it and which would make it an offence to assault any worker in the course of their work because there are other public facing workers like receptionists you know transport staff who suffer similarly now obviously with retail there's the financial element you know the theft element which you know the if legislation's drafted well it could cap it would capture that as an aggravating fact you know theft violence you know the aggravating factors um but i wonder whether in fact in terms of gaining political attention into political policy, if it was looked at in terms of all workers, because that would then bring in retail. Um, it's just a suggestion. Um, but I think, I mean, you know, all workers deserve protection mm -hmm. in their places of work. Thank you. I may have to run off, by the way. I've got another meeting at seven. So forgive me if I disagree. Okay, Margaret. Um, yeah. Just just because when Pan and I gave evidence to public bill committee in the commons a few weeks ago um this came up actually and what was yeah. interesting is that is that the minister is a man called chris philp who's the mp for croydon south um <clears throat> the policing minister's view was actually the reason you wouldn't do a standalone offense for retail workers is that that would expand to every kind of worker and actually that's a reason not to do, 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 do it because you know then then there's no in his view i don't i don't i don't, I don't agree with him margaret but his hit his view. I guess I guess the point that I made, I think Paddy did and Helen from the Patrice Consortium is that at the minute there is a real acute uh, problem for retail workers. In the same way that about five years ago was a terribly acute problem for emergency workers, hospital, um, ambulance and uh, fire service. And actually when we've got the levels of lawlessness we have got, you probably do need a very specific intervention in law to address that specific issue. Um, I'm not sure this government, Margaret, will be interested in a um, broader offence. Um, I think a, a, a different government, we can all hope, a different government might well be interested in that, and certainly Paddy will have been involved in conversations more broadly about, about the way government looks to support workers and employees. Yeah, I mean, to just to come in on that, Paul, um, am I on mute? Yeah. Can you hear me, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, just to, come in, I mean, yeah to, to, just to come in on that, uh, I mean, Margaret make, makes a great point, but as Paul said, it was raised by the police and crime minister. Uh, why not school teachers? Why not, uh, you know, people working behind social security screens? Well, the, the, I mean, we're not hearing a big clamour from the, the these other workers, but we have for many, many years now seen the endemic proportion of uh, abuse and thefts and assaults and retail workers, and that's why it's so important. Um, and you know, most of the committee that was there took on board what we were saying. Uh, no, no worker, and let's be. I think Paul and I being the same, and and Emily being the same page. No worker should have to go to work. Um, and be under the threat of, of, of abuse, that's or violence towards them. It doesn't matter who it is. But retail workers are public facing. Uh, they meet with the public every single day. They work in their own communities, live in their own communities, and sadly been abused in their own communities. And as I said earlier, the, 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 this isn't a victimless crime. It's, you know, in terms of, I said, the cost issue is massive, and we all pay for that. But more for me is the people issue where. Uh, you know, our, our members are being, even if they've been shouted at, they can traumatise and they can cause mental health issues. It can have an effect where who's coming around the corner next, how's it going to affect me? And when you listen to some of the stories that we've got to listen to in every survey and can round stores every single day, they're horrific and they're heartbreaking. People's having, uh, they're spat at, they're being shouted at, they're having things thrown at them, they're being threatened to be seen after work. And most of them live in their own community. So, most of the, the prolific offenders are known to most uh, to most people uh, as well. So, you know, for, for, for me, 
you know, we need to concentrate on this. Uh, it's retail at this moment in time, uh, and we need to make sure we get a standalone offence that makes it absolutely clear to the courts, to the police, and to, more importantly, the criminal fraternity, that enough's enough, and we need to now head this off, along with everything else we've been talking about this evening. Thank you very much, and and, and really um, interesting question, really. And I guess when we're we're looking at this this campaign, um, I see Jim McKenzie has very patiently had his hand up for a while. So, do you want to ask your question, uh, Jim? Oh, you're on mute, Jim. Let's let's get you unmuted. There we go. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. In fact, in fact, just last year there, I was at a talk in the co-op history, and, and the lad was talking about the, the old co-op shops there, and he had some pictures, and all the staff were indeed behind the behind the counter. And if you wanted any item, the member of staff would pick it from the counter. If you wanted a bottle of whiskey, they would take it from behind the counter, and they did serve each individual customer, you know, that way. People would have a list of what they wanted, whether it be the, the beans or the mints or whatever. So that way is that the people couldn't actually pick up any item themselves. It would be the shop staff that had all the items, in fact, behind them. That way there. So this wonder, you know, you know if that would be a pilot scheme, you have to bring back the old way of shopping. That would um, stop someone going in and actually lifting an item themselves or, and actually walking out with it. I know it would probably be a cost element on it. But then it's, there's a cost element just now for CCTV and security guards. So just wonder what the panel would they uh, think of that? Uh, uh, thank you, Jim, and I'll, I'll come to the retailer, Paul, on that. <laughs> um, um, I can remember as a kid, absolutely that that kind of setup. I guess my only observation would be now, Jim, is that the people who are coming in to take product from our stores are determined to take product from our stores. It doesn't really matter how we structure the store. They are going to take that that product. And actually, we had a phenomena which we are now beginning to address where there are some products that you've got to ask for because they're, they're behind the kiosk. So it'll be uh, your spirits, your vapes, your um, high-value uh, cosmetics like razors and things. And they're already behind a kiosk. And often our kiosk now, because of COVID, will have the plastic screens because we needed those and we kept them. What we've seen... And it was happening, I can think of a store in London where it was happening three or four times a week, is that the gangs are coming in to target the spirits and the cig cigarettes and the vapes. They are jumping behind the kiosk, often armed, in order to wipe out the kiosk and rinse the kiosk, kiosk clean. Our colleagues are often still stuck behind the kiosk with these animals. They take out what's from the, behind the kiosk and then leave. So in a sense, the kiosk hasn't stopped them. I don't think a kiosk would stop them. I think what you've described absolutely would stop someone who is a um, opportunist and might say, oh, I'll just have an extra this or an extra that. I think you're absolutely right on that. But that's not what's driving a 44% increase in crime and a 36% increase in um, in violence. And I guess I can think of stores when I've been abroad on holiday and some stores in the UK where everything is locked up and you go to a small kiosk and you ask, I don't think that's where we want to get to as a country. I don't think it's where we want to get to as a, a, a retailer. We want our co-op stores to be what they are, at the heart of a community. People can come in, meet staff, talk to people, pick up the shopping, be part of that community. I think if you have that arrangement, Jim, I'm not sure it would stop it, but I think it would affect the, the community hub that co-op shops often are. Yeah, I, I, mean, but, I, but, I agree with I you. Yeah, I, to I totally agree with you, Paul. And you made a really key point there. Retail is the community. It's the heart of the community. And we don't want to make it into a fortress where people people can come in. But it, I mean, Jim's idea, I mean, as much as I mean, we can all look back in the nostalgia, uh, the such a diverse range of stores from large superstores through to little independent convenience stores. It just wouldn't be practical in, in today's world to do that. And you're quite right. A lot of the high value goods are already behind counters. And we've seen the criminal guys coming in well organized two at the door, two over the counter. They're in and out within within minutes. They've left the staff traumatised and customers traumatised and they're away with maybe many, many thousands of goods. So, yeah, I mean, we need all the ideas we can get to look at and try to make this, uh, the situation better. I still come back to, we need it to be a, a resource issue for the police 
and a priority for the police to investigate everyone and have a data tracking measure to be able to see what's going on uh, around the country. But this is getting, you know, it's, it's, it's appalling behaviour this minute in time. It's getting worse. Thank you. I think there's something about tackling the issue, isn't there? And and um, in in terms of um, what we're looking at, and and just to explain, I'm not ignoring Emily, but her, I think her Wi-Fi is finally given <laughs> up. So we will plow on, and um, if she is able to come in, and um, we will try and bring her in. But um, we, we're coming towards the end, and I've got um, I've got a really good question from Lee for us to end on. So I'm just going to bring in um, David. Um, next. Now, uh, David has shared that he is a retired retail security officer. And I think that, did you want to share your experience, David, or did you have a question? David Gator, that is, not David Pickersgill. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, if you just want to unmute, David. Oh, we can't hear you, David. You just need to unmute. You're still on mute. Still on mute. Oh, David, I we can't get you. Oh, sorry, there we uh, go. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, just quickly, and it's this is a quick, quick. Um, this should be a quick answer to this. I I worked for years in the retail um, security industry but not for the co-op, for a company that was independent of the store. I won't name the company because it was, and I tried to join ASDO, but I got slated for that for um, my company. In fact, I, I was told if you join a union, you, you'll be sacked. Right. Okay. There was two uh, two of us in the store. My colleagues didn't want to join, so I really had no option. Unfortunately, I had one incident that could have caught, that could have me ended up in a box. We actually arrested a fella for eye on drugs. Was nicking two bottles or trying to nick two bottles of vodka. He broke one. We eventually, eventually got it, got him back into the old in room. And somehow, and I, to this day, I don't know, he's got me up against the wall with the broken net bottle at my neck. And I knew he was going to use that it took three police officers to pull him off. This was probably 2008, 2029. And of course, I got no help from the uh, company. I wasn't even allowed to take the, the next day off. And it, it's living with me now. So things have got to be done for those that are traumatized. It. And I think the uh, courts need to get stricter with sentencing. That fellow ended up getting sentenced to nine months. He was out in three, back in the store. And in 16, in 2016, I was over the age of 66, so I decided that was it. Pack it in. A, a good, I mean, a really good example, David, in terms of, and sorry about the, the sort of trauma you put through. The first point about being sat in the joint of the union, sadly, I mean, a very draconian attitude still with some employers in the 21st century. And we have demonstrated uh, as a trade union, we work responsibly with employers, with uh, local authorities, with local government, uh, that to ensure employees are looked after, but also businesses grow. But you, you, you identify a very traumatic experience you've had. That anyone that had went through that would be horrific. And to have that in, in your mind every single day. And that's the worst side of the violence you see in retail. That's why we're uh, campaigning along with the retailers. The retailers and the, all the retailers have been fully behind us, from the large to the independents. 
to try to ensure we get a standalone defence to recognise people like yourself, individuals out there every day, needs the protection of government. And I say this, you're a guard or a security, security specialist. Retail workers are, are having to deal with uh, underage sales, i.e. alcohol, glue, drugs, cigarettes, etc. That's a legislation from the government. And the government's asked them to do that and be the policeman and woman then they should give them the proper support and back up at the need when they are attacked or abused in the retail sector. Uh, but really, so, so sorry to hear what's happened to you, David, on that. Thank you very much, um, Paddy, and thank you for sharing, David. I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that, Paul. No, that's that's fine. No, I, 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 I was going to say no, but um, first of all, as, as Paddy said, um, you know, real, really sorry, David, had to go through that. Some of the abuse and violence that our security guards take is horrendous. Yeah. Um, and it particularly frustrates me when you hear ministers say, oh, you, um, and politicians, oh, you just get a security guard, they can arrest them. As David, as you just described there, honestly, if it was that, if it was that easy, it'd be good, but it's not. Yeah. And I'm... Um... So I'm conscious we're coming to the end. So I'm going to take a question from Lee Ro Rhodes, um, which I think is a good one for us to to leave on, I guess, on, on what we can kind of do next. So are you there, Lee, to ask yep. your question? I am just indeed. explain who, who you are as well. Sure. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Lee Rhodes. I'm the chair of a CLP in the West Midlands. And what I'd like to ask your speakers and then throw back to you, Emma, as a challenge to the co-op to produce the materials, um, is what, what um, would you like me to run as a campaign in my area to support shop workers and highlight the role and impact of police and crime commissioners? You, you want me to go first, Paul? Um, it, it, certainly. Th thanks for that, Leanne. As a, a CLP uh, chair, I mean, we share all our materials with CLPs. I would ask the first thing I do if you can is contact our, our, our retail office in the Midlands. We have lots of materials there which help support local councillors, uh, local police and crime commissioners, uh, good, solid uh, uh, sort of uh, research and intelligence. And setting out the sort of the case for you, so you don't have to go and do too much. I don't mean that disrespectful, but it's there for you, and I'll be able to do it. But I think it's a good one, especially coming up to an election, which will be this year. This is going to be a momentous year for us, and we need to do everything to demonstrate to the public that Labour's on their side, and these are things that we can do. Everyone is someone that works in retail, or knows someone that works in retail, and retails at every postcode in the whole of the UK. So, you know, I can understand the current Conservative government not wanting to legislate for this. This is a win-win for them. And it just seems to be just going over their heads. Labour's already committed uh, to, to making a standalone offence. Um, and uh, for me, that's that, if, that's, if, that was, if I was a retailer, that's one reason I, I'd be trying to get Labour back into power. But if you need resources, uh, Lee, we have got an abundance of 20 years. We run a respect campaign every November, but we run campaigns throughout the year. And this... Uh, last year's November campaign was on uh, uh, reported sorted, i.e. was an under under reporting of crime. I think because some retail workers feel, what's the point? Nobody listens to me. Or if I do report it, nothing happens. We've got to get get them over that. You know, they're not there to be abused. They're there to serve the community and they should have that respect going forward. But yeah, contact our local office and we'll supply you whatever you need. Thank you. Um, Lee, just uh, I guess there's just to build on what Paddy said. There's an election coming up for PCCs. Um, it would be great if every uh, PCC made a commitment to um, implement the Retail Crime Action Plan. So the, the as Emily said before, the National Police Chiefs Council have published on the 23rd of October the National Retail Crime Action Plan. Google or other search engines are are, are available to find it. Um, it would be great to get every PCC saying they're going to de deliver that. And um, perhaps, you know, for people on this call, it would be great if Labour PCCs did that first, as Emily's done in, in Merseyside, because uh, I'm sure it would embarrass others to do so as well. The other thing I guess I would say is there may be an opportunity, you know, um, de depending on how this... The standalone offence will be an amendment that Labour bring to the Criminal Justice Bill. There may be an opportunity, depending on how they bring it, for people to start to write to their MP, whoever their M MP is, and say, 
are you going to back it? You know, we, we did it a, cu- a couple of years ago and actually that resulted in a Conservative MP tabling an amendment that ended up with the aggravated offence. So right. I, I would watch this, this space because I think there's an opportunity if it goes to report session committee of the whole house that we can suddenly start to write to MPs and say, are you going to back it? And if not, why not? And again, we will provide content to do that. So if you're a court member, we absolutely will provide content for that. Thanks, Paul. Don't make me wait too long watching this space. I need it <laughs> fast. I know, um, I know. Well, I was about to say, um, there were a couple of things that you, you can be doing um, now. So um, we're holding this Zoom um, tonight, but raising awareness of this issue and taking it back to your CLPs, your branch meetings and talking about it. I know in the West Midlands, you've got Tom McNeil as your Assistant Police and Crime Commissioner. He knows about this issue. They've been holding round tables, for example, um, with retailers on this issue to look at ways of um, tackling it. So invite them to your CLP, get people talking about this issue and really raise awareness. Um, to it and um, get your your candidates um mayoral pcc um signed up particularly to the the stop shop theft um pledge as well uh, and help them make it part of their campaign for the may elections as well and then finally i put a link in the chat where you can sign our retail crime um letter as well <laughs> But also there's the opportunity through that to sign up to updates on this campaign. And as Paul says, the next few weeks, um, there is the opportunity for us to, to possibly change the law and get that standalone offence. So your help um, in doing that would be really um, great. And there will be plenty of opportunities through the work that the COP group's doing, through USDOR and through ourselves at the COP party to shout about that on social media and put pressure on our politicians uh, as well so it's a really timely call this because we, we have that opportunity over the next um few weeks thank you i think emily has has properly um dropped off so i can't bring her in um but i just want to to say a big thank you and um, thank you for your questions they've been really good and thank you for joining us this evening and a massive thank you to our um really great panel that we've had um tonight in terms of emily and um, paul gerald from the group and paddy lillis as well as, as um, general secretary of usdor um really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our members um tonight so with that i will leave you to it and have a good evening thanks Emily. Uh -huh. Cheers. Thanks, Paul. See you.